Father, we pray all these things in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. <coughs> One of the biggest reasons I think that people give for not watching the news on television is because the news seems to always be negative. It always seems like there was someone who was assaulted or robbed or murdered or whatever the case is. And with all the things that we deal with in our lives, I sort of understand why people don't want to turn on their TV and see more of the same on the news. We want to make life as enjoyable as we can, so usually we don't want to dwell on the negative. But did it ever occur to you that if not for the devil, for the enemy, then we wouldn't have death at all? We wouldn't have all these bad things happen. So he is really the one that we can sort of thank for that. People often ask God why he allows bad things to happen, yet I don't often hear anyone ask the enemy why he chose evil in the first place. So the devil is our focus one more time this morning as we finish up our look at the devil through the writings of the Apostle Paul. And we're going to look at a passage from the book of Hebrews in this series that admittedly there is a debate among scholars if uh, Paul actually wrote this letter or not. Um, we're going in and out. <laughs> we'll see what happens here. People aren't actually sure if he wrote it. Um, there's, I think there's strong evidence to say that he did not, but I do know conservative scholars that say that he did. Even if he didn't, I think you can see his influence in the letter, which is why I'm including it this morning. So we'll look at Hebrews chapter 2 this morning and just look at five verses, the last five verses in chapter 2, which if you're following in your pew Bible, you'll find on page 846. In reading from Hebrews chapter 2, verses 14 through 18, it says, Since the children have flesh and blood, he too shared in their humanity, so that by his death he might destroy him who holds the power of death, that is, the devil, and free those who all their lives were held in slavery by their fear of death. For surely it is not angels he helps, but Abraham's descendants. For this reason he had to be made like his brothers in every way, in order that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in service to God, and that he might make atonement for the sins of the people. Because he himself suffered when he was tempted, he is able to help those who are being tempted. May the Lord's blessing be added to the reading and the hearing of his holy word. As the author writes, it is the devil who has the power of death. And keep in mind that despite this, God is still sovereign regardless of what happens. He always has been in control and he always will be in control. The good news is that uh, the death and resurrection of Jesus broke the devil's power. But you need to, of course, have faith in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior to break the devil's power of death over you. This is the power with which the devil enslaves humanity through the fear of death. Again, we're all too aware of death. No one here, uh, there's no one here whose life hasn't been affected by it. Uh, as just yesterday, uh, we memorialized uh, Brother Merle Bear. We try to soften the blow of death by using some different words. We'll say, oh, he, he passed away, or uh, he rest in peace, or departed from this world. But the result is the same. The person is no longer with us, and they have been robbed of the earthly life that God intended for his creatures. Now, we learn in history class about terrible things that have happened in the past, that way hopefully we can not repeat those things in the future, such as the Holocaust during World War II at the hands of the Nazis. Maybe you've seen television programs. 
I'm just going to turn this off because it's annoying me and it's probably annoying you even more. <coughs> so we see television programs about things like the Holocaust and um, admittedly it's an extreme example where about 12 million people were mercilessly killed in accordance with Hitler's final solution. Of those who survived, there are still a few who are alive today and the details of their testimonies of the things they've endured are horrifying. Sadly, there have been too many such massacres uh, to varying degrees throughout the course of history. I don't want to ever dwell on death much more than we have to, but I want to say that according to the publication Psychology Today, scientists conclude that those who think about death more often tend to be funnier people. Sort of odd. We wouldn't expect that to be the case because we'd expect a person who thinks about death a lot to be a rather uh, gloomy person. But this is what the scientists say. So, and I can say that from my ex limited experience, um, the funeral directors that I have dealt with actually have rather good sense of humor. So maybe, it, maybe there's something to that. Now, and you know, every you know, we have we have a lot of jokes about death too. We have someone died and went to the gates of heaven. You know, that's that's a joke about death, and a lot of them are funny. Now, there it does remind me of a story about a new employee. He had been working at a job for not too long, maybe a month or so, and he called off work one day to attend his grandmother's funeral. And the next day, the employee went back to his job, and the boss took him aside first thing in the morning, and he said, how are you coping with your loss? And he says, oh, not too bad. And the boss asked him, i got to ask you this question. Do you believe in life after death? And the employee thought for a moment and said, you know, I'm really not sure. And the boss said, well, I think you should, because yesterday when you were off for your grandmother's funeral, she stopped in here to see you. <laughs> so we can make jokes about death like that, but I think people find talking about it, um, you know, quite often uh, rather depressing. And when you think of it, though, our whole Christian faith centers around death, or one death in particular, that was the atonement of Jesus Christ, his death on the cross. No one had more influence than Jesus, and no death ever meant more than his, but we know that his death was not the end, as on the third day he rose and was alive again. As the author of Hebrew writes, the devil holds the power of death, but that ended with Jesus Christ. And as believers, we want to avoid the devil with all of our being. But the mature believer understands the devil and he understands why he does the things that he does. So we can't totally be ignorant of him and his ways. What I'm trying to say is that the devil has spent literally thousands of years deceiving mankind. He told people who didn't who didn't believe in God, that God didn't exist. That was a lie. And he told God's people that he, the devil, also didn't exist. That's an ironic lie too. Not only that, the devil taps into man's desire to exalt himself. The devil knows something about exalting himself too, since that's how he got his start. So the devil continually tells humans that they have to keep working to be the best that they can in order to get to heaven. Devil says it's all about you. That's a big lie. The fact is it was all about Jesus and what he did for us. Devil tells us all you have to do is say certain prayers. Devil will even tell us that we can, if he thinks that it will make us think we can earn our way into heaven, he'll tell us to go to church if we think that we are doing that to earn our way into heaven. He'll tell us to give money to the poor. He'll do all these things 
as long as it doesn't include Jesus Christ in it. The devil's lie is that we can save ourselves by the things that we do. In so doing, through all these years, the devil had created this elaborate house of cards built upon deception and lies. Some of God's people didn't fall for it, while some did. Some used God's law as a checklist of things to do to be good enough to get into heaven. They bought into the lie, but our faith should shine the light upon Jesus rather than ourselves. And that is why Jesus had to die so that we could live. When Jesus died, that devil's elaborate house of cards finally fell. And the death of Jesus unleashed the power of God's grace on anybody who would believe in him. And it's most ironic, too, because all throughout Jesus' life, you can be sure that the devil was keeping a close eye on Jesus. He was watching anybody who he thought remotely resembled the coming Messiah because he knew that someone was going to come. So he wanted to make sure this person was cut off early. I emphasize, or mention this to emphasize the fact that this is the same devil that we are still up against today. It doesn't ch he doesn't change his tactics because they've been rather effective throughout thousands of years. And consider that Jesus, or the Satan, tried to kill Jesus many times in his life. When Jesus was first born, Herod issued a decree that all male babies under two be killed. That didn't work out too well for him. He tried to starve Jesus in the wilderness when he was about 30 years old. That didn't work either. He tried to drown Jesus on the Sea of Galilee when he sent the big storm. That didn't work either. Later there was a scene at a synagogue where he incited the Jews to, to rise up and kill Jesus, but he escaped unharmed. That didn't work either. But finally it was the Passover, about three years after his ministry began, when Jesus was brought before Pilate. Pilate found no fault in Jesus, but the bloodthirsty crowd demanded that he be crucified. So Pilate relented and gave in to the will of the people. The irony is that whenever the Romans were driving the nails through his hands and feet, that I can imagine Satan was probably as excited as he had ever been because what he had been trying for so long to get accomplished was finally being completed. And I can imagine the devil when Jesus took his very last breath, he probably couldn't contain himself whenever Jesus said, it is finished, because Jesus was finally dead. But we know that's not the end of the story. Three days later, imagine how things, the tables had turned when God breathed life into Jesus and he carefully folded his grave clothes and walked out of the tomb. It's very ironic that it was Jesus' death that broke the power over death. Actually, his resurrection, but you can't be resurrected until you die, so it goes hand in hand. We know now that the devil is more furious than ever, and we know he knows his time is short. It has been 2,000 years since those events happened, and again, how much longer can we really go? So when we talk about Jesus and how he's our Savior, we need to realize not, and not just anybody could do what Jesus did. Um, we needed the perfect sacrifice. It wouldn't be enough to have any of us here crucified, or even the Apostle Paul crucified, or Moses, or Noah, or Peter, or any of the uh, saints that we read about in the Bible. It had to be someone completely human, as these men were, but also it had to be someone uh, who was uh, completely divine as well, and that Jesus was the only one who qualifies. But I think oftentimes we uh, don't focus as much on Jesus as humanity because we think about how he is, or is God, was God in the flesh. 
there are many big questions in Christian theology. People debate questions all the time about the Trinity. How do you completely wrap your mind around the Trinity? People debate Calvinism and Arminianism and all these big words that we don't, don't even know what half of them mean. But the big question is, is Jesus man or is he God? Well, he is both. Some had speculated uh, both sides of the issue and the church had finally uh, settled on the middle as being uh, true. And we're not talking a 50-50 split. We're talking about two different natures which allows him to be 100% man and 100% divine. Seems like a contradiction, but it's not. Just because I'm a husband and a son, it doesn't mean I'm now half a husband and half a son. So it's something similar like that is what we're talking about. Jesus' human nature didn't interfere with his godly nature, and his godly nature didn't interfere with his human nature. He still had to grow. He had to learn things intellectually. So you have to sort of separate those things. That's why the writer of Hebrews is correct when he says Jesus was fully human in every way. Why is this important to us? It's because we know as a human Jesus experienced the same temptations and trials that we do. We can't pray to God and say, well God, you don't know what I'm going through. Because he does. Jesus was a man. He went through all of these different things. And, you know, it, that's just a little bit of how Jesus is qualified to be our Savior. Again, people write volumes and volumes of books to try to m more better understand this, but yet, you know, it's just something that we have to do our best to wrap our minds around. But the important thing is that um, if we have faith in Jesus Christ, then the, what we passed from this world is not the end for us. The writer, author of Hebrews writes that the devil enslaves the world through the fear of death. But that's not the case for the believer in Christ because we should no longer have that fear. Near the beginning of the message I spoke briefly about the Holocaust and the terrible tragedy that that was. Last week we talked briefly about uh, abortion being in, in the news and about how a, a million or more American babies are lost every year. But really, if you turn on the news, there's hardly a word about a much larger slaughter that has taken place for many, many years and there's hardly ever a word about it. What I'm talking about is where an average in the just the hundred years of the 20th century, every hour during that hundred years, 51 people were killed for a hundred years. Whatever that comes, that comes out to 45 million people. These are Christian martyrs who gave their lives for their faith. Interestingly enough, in the hundred years of the 20th century, we have had more Christian martyrs than the prior 1900 years combined. It more than doubled from 1900 to 2000. And in the 21st century, it's still going at a very high rate. But you hardly hear a word about it in the news. These are Christians who are willing to give their lives for their faith. And that is a very significant reason why we can believe that Jesus is who he said he was. Because people are rarely willing to give their lives for something that they know to be a lie. So, where am I at here? <laughs> They're fired up about some things. I just don't know why. It's not mentioned, I mean, I guess I do know why, because the devil is the ruler of this world here. And he doesn't want people to be attracted to the Christian faith because what you notice is that in the areas of the world where there is much higher Christian persecution, there are more and more believers attracted to the faith to replace those who were lost. Again, contradictory to what we would think, but that is the power of the Holy Spirit in the world. 
They know that Jesus is fully human in every way. He has experienced the things that they have experienced, and that is why they are willing to put their lives on the line for him. After all of this talk of death, though, I want to close you with hopefully inspiring words about the fact that we serve a loving God who wants us to live with him forever. He loves us so much he sent his son to be, uh, become that human that we can identify with, who is also the perfect bridge for us between uh, the bridge between us and God. If we are born again in Jesus, we know that we will only have to die once, where if you are not saved by Jesus, then you will experience uh, the second death as well that we read about in the book of Revelation. If you do have faith in Jesus Christ, we are the people that the author of Hebrews is talking about when he talks about Abraham's descendants, because Abraham's righteousness was credited to him by his faith. And it is faith that aligns us with him and with Jesus Christ. We are the ones who are covered by the atonement of Jesus that was made by this merciful and faithful high priest. Not a day should go by that we don't thank Jesus for the work that he did, becoming human to be just like us, facing the temptations, taking the punishment that we deserve and for finally breaking the power of the devil who holds the power over death and because of that we can finally live forever with faith in Jesus Christ let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer we will conclude our service this morning by singing together our hymn of dedication I mentioned it earlier it will be number 326 is wonderful words of life.